Uh, thanks very much. I'm uh, really happy to be here. And I must admit, part of the uh, reason for wanting to come was thinking of having a nice, quiet drive down to this lovely setting and spending a couple of days with really smart people talking about something that's uh, really important to me, uh, something I really care about, and something that I'm trying to get IES uh, to do the same. Um, it's pretty clear to me that I was invited to this conference because somebody read that talk I gave a year ago to the, <laughs> <laughs> to the National Council on Measurement uh, in Education. Uh, that was April uh, in 2012. And um, it, there's a quote in the promotional material for, th for this conference that came directly uh, out of that speech. Uh, in that speech, I sort of uh, use the expression that I was extolling the power of measurement. And I was speaking to a group of uh, high-end psychometricians, uh, and I was really trying to urge them to get involved in real-world problems. Um, and, in, and I listed several uh, real-world wor problems where I thought we really needed that technical expertise to get uh, on the ground. And one of them was to, I talked about, uh, measuring non-cognitive skills. And I'm going to use this term, non-cognitive. Chris, where are you? I apologize. <laughs> um, um, but uh, a year ago, uh, when I was talking to this group, just like today, um, I really knew that you guys know much more about what I'm talking about uh, than I do. Um, but I'm going to go ahead anyway, because I think it's uh, uh, so important. I would like to say that I sort of wish that I had been able to write this talk after this conference, <laughs> because already I've learned so much that I wished I could have uh, worked in here uh, today. So I'm trying to weave together three sort of very separate ideas. Um, uh, the first is this: the importance, the uh, of the, the importance and potential positive impacts of good measurement. Uh, the second one is the importance of uh, these non-cognitive or motivational skills for uh, both children and adults. And finally, the importance of uh, partnerships between researchers and practitioners. But I, I, I am going to start on a cautionary uh, note. Uh, a couple of months ago, uh, when I began, I've been thinking a lot about measurement. A couple of months ago, I picked up a book that I read decades ago. Uh, it's something of a classic, and it's called The, the Mismeasure of Man. It was written by uh, someone named Stephen J. Gould. It was written in 1981. And you can tell by the title, The Mismeasure of Man, that it's old, because that was an acceptable <laughs> title at that time. It maybe wouldn't be uh, today. And uh, Gould, uh, uh, this is kind of a history of scientific endeavor centered on, quote, uh, numbers to rank people in a single series of worthiness, uh, invariably to find that oppressed and disadvantaged groups, races, classes, or sexes, are innately inferior and deserve their status. And that's, uh, uh, that little summary is why he chose the title, The Mismeasure of, of Man. Uh, and Gould describes a, a sci serious scientific endeavor of folks who uh, first uh, measured people's skull size, uh, then their body size. Uh, and this kind of led up to the measurement of uh, intelligence in IQ tests. And over nearly a century, most of the studies using these techniques uh, ended up proving uh, that white northern Europeans were superior to about everyone else. Uh, much of the book, much of uh, Gould's book, is really about this idea of uh, reification, uh, which is also called the uh, uh, reification fallacy. A and what, what this is, is this is this happens when we uh, treat an abstract, abstract idea as if it were a real and tangible thing. 
And this often comes about when we learn how to measure something. So like, for example, after Binet developed the intelligence test, a whole generation of scientists uh, reified intelligence. And they arrived at a point where they could measure or measure intelligence better than they could define it or understand it. And so the IQ score itself took on a meaning of its own, uh, a life of its own, and one that was much more precise uh, than the, the meaning of the underlying uh, concept that, that the IQ test was meant to measure. Uh, you, know, you heard in the introduction that uh, for uh, several years I was uh, director of research and evaluation at Chicago Public Schools, and part of my job was being responsible for administering, scoring, and reporting uh, the Iowa tests of basic skills every year. And the Iowa was one of the most uh, basic of the very popular standardized achievement tests uh, and very wide, widespread use at the time. And Chicago Public Schools had given the IO for, for decades and it was a, in firmly entrenched as part of the culture of the district. But even before No Child Left Behind came into play, uh, Chicago started taking high stakes accountability uh, very seriously and the district uh, held students back on the basis of their IO scores. They placed schools on probation uh, based on the percent of students who scored at or above national norms on the IO. Now at the time, I had a sort of a personal love-hate relationship with this uh, with the Iowa and other assessments like it. Uh, they've got a lot going for them. They're cheap, they're easy to administer, they're highly reliable, and they're very predictive. Uh, they're certainly very <coughs> predictive of other test scores, but they're also predictive of other important outcomes as well. And to be fair, they clearly do measure some important skills. But as we know, on the other hand, they're very reductionist, a very reductionist view of student learning. And uh, as we know painfully, as we increase accountability stakes, uh, they lead to many negative effects, uh, the one of which is really dumbed down teaching. So what struck me then uh, when this uh, accountability was uh, new and unprecedented was how much meaning these scores took on of their own. Um, as if uh, numbers like 3.8s and 6.3s and 5.5s meant something real. Um, uh, I was really astounded at the time, and still am to some extent, uh, about how little interest people have in the actual content of the test. <laughs> you know, um, what are the knowledge, skills, and abilities that students were being asked to demonstrate? I shouldn't have been as surprised, but I still was, at how little interest uh, many people had in the technical properties of various scores. Uh, they used great equivalents, but had no clue how they were derived. Uh, they didn't know how they were related to scale scores, percentile rankings, uh, stainines. Uh, the school district kind of made what I thought was something problematic a little bit worse because uh, they rated schools on the percent of students who scored at or above the national norms. So not only do we have this uh, uh, underlying questionable measurement system going on, but we're aggregating and using a um, metric which is uh, quite uh, uh, weak on its own. So in this period, in the accountability area, the school district you know, stopped talking about student learning and talked about test scores instead. The scores themselves became more important wh than what they were supposed to be measuring. So clearly this is another example of reification uh, when the ease of quantification overtook the meaning and importance of the underlying concepts. 
it was much easier for people to talk about test scores than it was for them to talk about what stu students uh, need to know and do. So here I'm starting off with cases of measurement that isn't very salutary, uh, but I firmly believe that it can be, so I want to switch to some good examples of uh, good measurement and explore how they can help us. So I've said uh, in the NCME talk, and I'll say again, that I think there are at least three different ways that good measurement uh, can help. Uh, the first one, which may be of the most interest to this conference, is that it can facilitate scientific inquiry and add to scientific knowledge. But I think another really important point is it can uh, facilitate communication across stakeholder groups, and that's one I think really important. And the third one, which may be the most important, is that I think good measurement can catalyze productive and positive responses and behaviors. Uh, I've talked uh, a lot and written quite a bit about a leading indicator of high school graduation that several colleagues and I developed in Chicago uh, more than 10 years ago. We call this the on track to graduate indicator, and it's a very simple binary indicator. Uh, so a student's either on track or off track, depending on whether he or she had accumulated at least five full credits and no more than one semester F in a core subject at the end of freshman year. This is a pretty low bar, uh, yet students who are on track are four to five times more likely to graduate than students who are off track. Uh, but there are lots of ways to predict high school graduation, but it turns out this is one of the very best. Uh, it is much more predictive than many of the other uh, competitors like student demographics, their age, their prior grade retention, their school mobility, uh, and their previous achievement as measured by tests like the Iowa. So after we uh, created this thing, we did a lot of, uh, I wrote down here digging around, but I guess I should say research, uh, <laughs> to uh, find out why, why it was so uh, important. Uh, so we looked at the relationship between the on-track and student behaviors like attendance, doing homework, being engaged in classrooms, uh, kids asking about kids' sense of belonging, to see what was associated with the likelihood of being on track for graduation. You know, we asked if um, the predictors of being on track are different from things like uh, high school GPA. Uh, some of our best work, I think, was asking, well, what elements of the school and classroom environment are associated with student behaviors that lead to, lead to improved class performance? So we had a simple on-track indicator, reliable, <coughs> predictive validity. Uh, it's simple to understand, easy to calculate, and uh, easy to talk about. So here, you know, this, here's some what I call good measurement that helps us bring about some conceptual clarity by helping us to build and test models for linkages between what does it take to be on track, uh, th simple things like attendance, engagement, homework, other behaviors. But it also had a real plus and that facilitated communication among uh, a bunch of researchers at the University of Chicago uh, with a whole wide range of stakeholders who were seeking ways to improve high school graduation. So this common vocabulary really made this communication uh, easier. Parents, teachers, principals, researchers, administration, and even newspaper reporters uh, understood what it means. Uh, and finally, in this case, that uh, simple indicator led to quite a bit of productive action. Schools across the city began to w watch student engagement very carefully from the first day of freshman year and intervened when they saw signs that students appear appeared likely to fall off track. Uh, my colleague Elaine Allensworth just wrote a really nice paper that uh, about the use of this on-track indicator and how it was used across the city uh, in improving high school graduation rates. 
Uh, in, the, uh, in the last year or so, I've been uh, corresponding, this is kind of an unlikely correspondence, with a cochlear implant surgeon at the University of Chicago whose name is Dana Suskind. And for reasons that I don't fully understand, uh, when she's not doing surgery, she has this really cool project uh, called the 30 Million Word Project. Uh, and it was recently described in a New York Times blog called The Power of Talking to Your Baby. As you can probably guess, the title, this 30 Million Word uh, moniker, came from what people have estimated as the gap in the number of words that affluent three-year-olds have heard spoken compared to uh, poor three-year-olds. So uh, Dana works with uh, very poor mothers to help them increase verbal interactions with their kids. And she's developed a curriculum that starts off with talking about growth mindset. And uh, this is the idea that Carol Dweck and her colleagues have made popular, the, the idea that brains can grow in response to exercise. Uh, it then goes on to give mothers very concrete tips about how to talk to their children, how to uh, ask and answer good questions. So there's measurement in, involved in this in a uh, device called LENA, uh, Language Analysis System, and I'm guessing most of you know a lot about this, and I hardly know anything about it. But it's a little electronic device that gets strapped, gets tucked into a pocket and the child's uh, uh, shirt, and it records the sound environment uh, that the child is exposed to. But what I find really cool about it is that the, the Lena then provides the mothers with feedback. Uh, which in turn can motivate positive behavior uh, on the mother's part by encouraging them to increase these verbal interactions. Uh, Dana Suskind says that Lena provides concrete feedback in an easy to understand format. And there's a, I've got a video where one mother saying, getting the feedback from Lena was very moti motivating. A and another uh, said, every week I was waiting for the report to come back. As the weeks went on, I would challenge myself. So I have to uh, get a little personal here. Six weeks ago, I bought myself this little thing. It's called a Fitbit. Uh, anybody have a Fitbit? Oh, good. You know what I'm talking about. And I bought it because uh, I felt a little bit of a winter punch. I needed to get out more, and I wanted to see if this was going to help me. And, and when I bought it, I, I didn't know uh, that there is published research uh, on the benefits of pedometers and, and the feedback that they provide. I didn't know about this until I read a paper that Dana Suskind wrote on how this lean of feedback helps uh, increase adult verbal production. So she clearly is drawing an analogy between the quantitative linguistic feedback from Alina uh, and the, th to the information that pedometers and um, Fitbits uh, provide. Uh, I just have to, have to mention, I overslept this morning. I slept until 20 minutes past 7 for the first time in like 20 years. <laughs> uh, I, don't, I don't know how it happened. And I got up and I looked at this thing, I pushed it and it said, get going. <laughs> Um, so I, I'm not addicted to my Fitback, uh, Fitbit, but I really do love it. I, I sync it up every night. I look at my graphics. Uh, there have been several times when I looked at it and said, John, you're dragging your average down. You better go walk around the block. Um, uh, so it's working for me. Okay, I want to tell you, about a month ago, uh, the Office of Science and Technology Programs and uh, Office of Management and Business at the U.S. Federal Government held a meeting for senior officials uh, on the topic of behavioral economics. Uh, a guy named David Halpern, who's the director of 
the behavioral insights team from the Prime Minister's office in the United Kingdom, and Richard Thaler from the University of Chicago uh, were there to describe applications of behavioral insights to public policy. Uh, so many of these insights are heavily dependent on measuring key variables, but they're things like electricity usage, tax payments, and so forth. But they do provide feedback to encourage positive behaviors, uh, just like Lena does for the mothers and the Fitbit does for me. And you may know this, a couple of years ago, uh, there was a pretty popular book called Nudge, uh, Improving Decisions About Health, Wealth, and Happiness. Uh, the government really wants to see how we can use some of these ideas in policy formation. Okay, a little bit more about uh, non-cognitives. I, I know we all hate it, um, and it covers this whole broad range of stuff. Um, but you get sort of roughly the idea of what, what some of these are. Um, and there aren't a lot of uh, better alternative terms to just capture all this. Um, and I've been uh, thinking about this a lot for the last couple of years. And, and especially as I've observed uh, from pretty close hand some of the vociferous debates about the appropriate use of uh, achievement test scores in teacher and principal evaluation. Um, you know, uh, frankly, I'm really worried that we've become so consumed with achievement test scores that we've uh, marginalized uh, many other skills that are so crucial uh, for children's healthy development and for their success uh, both in and outside of school. So these ideas, you've, we've heard, we saw them on the board, you know, it's motivation, determination, perseverance, study skills, ability to work with others, resilience, metacognition, mindset, social and emotional skills, on and on. I'm staying kind of indiscriminate about uh, these various skills and terms, uh, knowing that they're very different, and knowing that uh, some are probably more important uh, or more ma malleable um, than others. So uh, in the public sphere, we're also hearing lots more about non-cognitive skills right now. So in addition to, this is a pretty much of an academic group, so you read academic publications, but you can see lots of famous scholars uh, discussing their uh, work for public audience on YouTube. Uh, Jim Heckman is on YouTube talking about the importance of non-cognitive skills on life outcomes and how skills beget skills. Carol Dweck is on uh, YouTube uh, talking about positive effects of growth mindset on academic outcomes. <coughs> Angela Duckworth is there talking about the importance of grit in making it through West Point, in winning spelling bees, uh, and even in graduating from high school in Chicago. Uh, in a recent TED Talk, which is really quite good, she advocates uh, developing growth mindset <coughs> as, a as a way to make kids uh, grittier. Uh, both Angela and Carol Dweck were at, at a meeting about growth mindset uh, in Washington sponsored by the White House, uh, uh, again, just about a month ago. And there's a growing consensus among a lot of top policy officials in the government that the uh, there's the evidence around growth mindset is pretty um, strong and that growth mindset can be uh, relatively easily taught on a large scale. Uh, a guy named uh, David Yeager, who's the author of a well-known paper called Social Psychological Interventions in Education, They're Not Magic, he calls this his magic paper. Uh, organized and facilitated uh, the meeting. One week after that meeting, uh, First Lady Michelle Obama spoke these words to a group of school children. She said, because the truth is, and this is important, I want you to all listen up, no one is born smart. Do you understand that? No one is born smart. No one is born uh, knowing how to read, write, no one is born knowing how to do math 
or no one is born knowing how to play the flute. All of that comes with a lot of hard work. And I know your teachers tell you the same. Uh, last year, uh, the journalist Paul Tuff wrote what I think is just a beautiful and compelling book called How Children Succeed, Grit, Curiosity, and the Hidden Power of Character. And uh, Tuff also argues that our national obsession with test scores is really misguided and that a lot of schools have been uh, emphasizing the wrong set of skills. Uh, this book contains many really nice anecdotal uh, descriptions of programs and schools that emphasize the development of non-cognitive skills and character. So this right now is a really a hot topic. Um, in the last year, I know of uh, four independent review papers on the importance of non-cognitive skills to children's success in and out of school. Uh, the Rakes Foundation commissioned a paper from former colleagues of mine uh, back in Chicago. Uh, the U.S. Department uh, of Education's Office of Ec Ed Technology Programs commissioned a paper on promoting grit, tenacity, and perseverance. Uh, the Stupsky Foundation uh, commissioned a paper to review mindset in interventions. And uh, on the international scene, the OECD commissioned Lex Bor Borghans and a bunch of colleagues to write on fostering non-cognitive skills to promote lifetime success. So you are probably all familiar with uh, sort of a, this gangbuster paper in 2011 by Raj Chetty, John Friedman, and Jonah Rockoff called The Long-Term Impacts of Teachers value added, and student outcomes in adulthood. Uh, you know, these guys had this huge data set. Um, and they found that uh, over more than a decade of uh, longitudinal, uh, they found that kids who had at just one, at least one high value teacher, high, highly effective high value add teacher, uh, measured by value add, and they say high value add is one standard deviation above the average, in either reading or math in between grades s four and nine, those kids with the effective teacher measured by value add were more likely to attend college at age 20, have steeper earning trajectories, and reduced likelihood of having children uh, as teenagers. So this is pretty strong evidence that good teachers, at, at least those measured by value add, uh, they really matter, and not just in the short term, but in the long term as well. So what I find really fascinating about this study is that these high value add teachers gave their kids a bump up in test scores and in learning rates as well. Uh, but uh, two thirds or more of that bump was gone uh, faded out a couple years later. And you know, this is a familiar finding that we, we see an intervention gets a short-term impact that goes away. Uh, but something is really going on here. We're seeing the fade out on the test scores, but these long-term distal outcomes, college going, earning money, avoiding teenage births. So I think what's going on here, my uh, sort of hypothesis is that these effective teachers are, uh, yes, they're boosting kids' achievement, but they're also boosting other important skills that aren't measured here at all. And these are probably these psychological constructs, motivation, grit, perseverance, self-control, emotional intelligence, sense of mastery, uh, whatever. Uh, there's a new paper that you may not know, which I just find Fascinating. It's an NBER working paper written by uh, a young guy at Northwestern whose name is Kiribo Jackson. And he, in this paper, he's analyzing impacts of, teacher, uh, of teachers on students' cognitive abilities as measured by test scores and what he calls non-cognitives that are measured by uh, attendance, 
suspension, grade, grade progress. Okay, and he asserts that this is, and I think he's right, this is the first paper to comprehensively analyze teacher effects on both cognitive and non-cognitive outcomes. And uh, he specifically addressing the questions of whether teachers can improve skills that are not measured on achievement tests. Uh, and Jackson says, this paper presents the first evidence that teachers have meaningful effects on non-cognitive outcomes that are strongly associated with adult outcomes and are not captured by test scores. Uh, while the test scores do pick up some skills, or probably pick up some skills, in addition to the straight achievement, there are a lot of other important things that just aren't getting measured. And so th the implications of these findings are uh, really pretty major and obvious. Uh, if we overemphasize the importance of test scores, uh, we're going to steer teachers away from helping kids develop these co non-cognitive skills that we think are so important. This is just another form of narrowing the curriculum. And in addition, that there are going to be many highly effective teachers who just aren't going to get um, uh, identified as highly effective because we're using test scores. So let me say just a little bit about the study. Um, it, it, it's e econometric modeling that's just way over my head, so I'll say that right off. Uh, but the basic method is they started with some NELS 88 data and built a model, uh, built a model, and then he tested it on this great big administrative database from North Carolina with over 350,000 kids. So in the NELS, he took the NELS database to show that non-cognitive abilities are associated with improved adult outcomes um, and, that, and that they're at least as important as the cognitive skills uh, in terms of the uh, long-term outcomes. So the North in the North Carolina data, he finds two important things, uh, which I just find really striking. First, teachers have larger impacts on the students' non-cognitive non skills than the on the cognitive skills. Now remember non-cognitive, we're talking about absences and suspensions and things like that. Um, and the second one is that uh, teacher cognitive effects are only weakly correlated to teacher non-cognitive effects. They are correlated, but it's not a strong correlation. So again, really uh, stark, startling um, implications of this study. Uh, another group of economists uh, said, uh, success in life depends on personality skills that are not well captured by achievement scores. Conscientiousness, perseverance, sociability, and curiosity matter. Uh, here's more evidence pointing in that direction. And if this is right, it really means we have to rethink what school is about. Not, o not only do we have to rethink how we evaluate teachers and principals, we've got to do some really basic rethinking. Okay, um, you know, earlier I said um, I'd been thinking a lot about imports of non-cognitive skills. And, and it, I started thinking about it because of all this controversy around uh, accountability and teacher effective, measuring teacher effectiveness. But I really feel sort of a personal stake in all of this. Um, you know, I'm getting up there and, you, you know, you look back and you ask yourself lots of questions. And I ask myself, well, you know, what, what satisfies me professionally and personally? And I think it's clear that, um, it's clear to me that what I care about is getting good at something. I mean, that's my, that's my ultimate um, uh, criteria. And I, I want to develop a sense of mastery. Um, I, I look back to uh, my dissertation advisor at the University of Chicago, uh, Benjamin Bloom, who culminated his career with a huge study uh, resulting in a book called Developing Talent in Young People. It's a totally qualitative study. Uh, uh, Bloom and his students uh, studied highly successful adult swimmers, pianists, tennis players, neurologists, and mathematicians. And the qualitative method with intensive interviews of these highly successful people 
their families, uh, their coaches, and their teachers. And uh, you know, they were trying to get at, well, how did they uh, reach to such high levels of, of success? And kind of the biggest, one of the most biggest findings was a, this huge investment of, uh, and commitment of time, energy, and effort that these experts and their families uh, put into developing their skills. But it wasn't uh, just hard work. It wasn't just raw effort. It was really uh, very focused, uh, very uh, deliberate, and very strategic. There's a fairly new book uh, by Jeff Colvin called Talent is Overrated that makes the point that success isn't about uh, innate talent, uh, nor is it about luck, um, but it's really about you know, practice uh, that's designed to improve performance. And as Bloom found, that practice was also facilitated by a teacher uh, who provided this continuous improvement. Now I bring this in because this is uh, my measurement, uh, measurement theme. But this practice and this effort, this 10,000 hours, well, how do you keep at it? And how do you keep at it when you fail a lot along the way? Um, how do you stay motivated? Uh, how, do you get, how do you get grittier? How do you do that? Um, how do you do what Michelle Obama is telling school children uh, to work har harder? You know, um, so for me, uh, my personal answer here is I think it comes from, I heard this this morning too, um, the, the, the idea of, of flow. Uh, this uh, concept of flow uh, was made popular 10, 20, 30 years ago by Mihai Csikszentmihalyi at the University of Chicago. And you know, flow is the uh, kind of state of mind um, when you're just really immersed, when you're focused, you're energized, you're engaged, you're a little bit outside of yourself, uh, in the zone. Uh, and sometimes people think of these, this flow experience as what you know, long distance runners and rock climbers and rock musicians get. But it's not just them, it's also uh, uh, researchers. Uh, uh, people who attend a conference because they really want to get engaged and they really want to learn. Uh, people who have to sit down and write something. They just want to get into it. Well, I think uh, we have to figure out how our young children, uh, our early adolescents, um, uh, can learn this too. How they can uh, get in the zone when they're learning new ideas and skills. So flow really motivates. Um, you know, if I keep at it, I'm going to get better. And if I'm really lucky, I'm going to uh, experience uh, that wonderful feeling of flow. And our kids need to learn this. Um, even when it's difficult, it's possible to love what you do. And uh, schools should be helping uh, students to learn this. So I think we are kind of agree that motivation and the so-called non-cognitives are um, important. We may not know uh, which are the most important, uh, although we've got a room full of people who've got lots of evidence and lots of strong feelings about this. Um, and we need to agree you know, how to focus on what are the most salient, uh, the most actionable, uh, the most uh, malleable among them. It's clear that there are measurement issues to deal with. This is pro a big, lots of measurement. Uh, and there are no easy measures. There's no on track to graduate, no count of adult verbal interactions, electricity usage, taxes paid, or in my case, steps taken uh, or stairs climbed that are going to give us the feedback that will uh, nudge us on. Um, and we also know that some of the current measures of non-cognitives are a little problematic. Uh, we've got plenty of good measures for research purposes, but I wonder, uh, as you have wondered, um, how many of them are much 
good beyond research. Uh, Self-report uh, liquored items can be problematic. Uh, how can we measure the right things in the right way so that good measurement leads to the three things that I said they could? Uh, how can we make sure we don't end up reifying non-cognitive uh, variables just because we can measure it? Uh, I assume, I hope that we're uh, not so naive that we'll reify the grit scale, hands, toes, elbows, knees, uh, the KIPP character report card, or galvanic skin response, which has reared its head again. Um, but the measurement really uh, is key here if we're going to move uh, on these non-cognitive skills uh, on a large scale for lots of kids. Okay, um, I'm going to, I'm almost done. I want to wrap up on this partnership idea between researchers and practitioners. Um, you know, before I got to Washington, I lived and worked in Chicago for more than three decades. Um, uh, I worked for the Chicago Public Schools. I worked for the Consortium on Chicago School Research. Um, and I've said many times how much I really loved the work uh, that we did at the Consortium working with the school district. Um, I like doing the research itself. I am a kind of at the core. I'm a social scientist. Um, but I particularly loved uh, being part of a broader community that really cared about uh, school improvement um, and who wanted to make schools better for a better place for a community uh, for students and their families and teachers. Uh, from the earliest days on, uh, the researchers at the consortium, Tony Bright, Penny Sebring, dozens of others, really wanted this research to matter. And I think really important to it is that we believed it could. And uh, I think that the, uh, the good measurement really facilitated this partnership with the Chicago Public Schools uh, as it can facilitate other partnerships at well. Uh, with the good measurement, as I said, everybody can be on the same page. They can know what they're talking about. And whether it's my on track to graduate, whether it's kindergarten readiness, college readiness, resilience, perseverance, growth mindset, or dozens of other concepts like that. Uh, IES has taken up the idea of uh, partnerships in many ways. Uh, for several years, we've had a research program called Evaluating State and Local Programs and Policies that requires partnerships between agencies and researchers. So obviously, the inherent premise in these grants is that the education agencies uh, will make use of the finding of this rigorous evaluation. Our, our new program, uh, new programs, Researcher Practitioner Partnerships and Continuous Improvement Research and Education, uh, share the belief that this equal partnership will require researchers to focus on topics of interest to the educators and that, that the educators, by having some skin in the game, uh, will make use of the findings. Uh, we're, through these, we're really promoting research use, but we don't see research use as a unidirectional research to practice. We really see it as a much more reciprocal process that involves uh, a pathway from practice to research. Uh, we just awarded seven new researcher practitioner grants and competing a new topic called Continuous Improvement Research and Education. Uh, the RFA was posted in early May. Proposals are due on the 4th of September, so I hope uh, you all know that. Um, th this continuous improvement, when I think uh, we actually say in the RFA that we'd love to see proposals around the development of uh, social, psychological, uh, non-cognitive things, because it seems to be a, w a good opportunity to fine-tune to uh, implement these uh, regimen of interventions and continue this iterative process, this tinkering, this focus on measurement um, and refinement. Uh, okay, so just to wrap up, um, so what I'm trying to say that the you know, partnerships 
uh, with the aid of good measurement, uh, education researchers can have a greater impact on school improvement efforts uh, by conducting uh, usable research that's meaningful to educators. You know, I also think, I hope I made the point that I think this whole terrain, motivation, social, psychological, non-cognitive, is just really crucial for the healthy development and future success of uh, school children and youth. And uh, good measurement is really key here. It can facilitate the partnership. It can help us uh, focus on and talk about important skills with a whole range of stakeholders. Help us keep these in proper perspective and at the same time continue the work of uh, building a body of scientific knowledge. Uh, thank you very much. Um, I'm glad you asked me. I'd uh, love to. kids production too but you know one of the things that we found for example is that ambient noise and violent crime uh, in the neighborhood uh, we can't find a measure to pick up that setting level and it might be incredibly valuable to know what's going on in the setting is there a taste um, or appetite for that federally um, in addition to the uh, emphasis on, on teachers and kids that's a great question <laughs> so well, I don't know what to say uh, I know um, I, I would guess, certainly through IES, it would have to be combined, you know, it would have to be woven into what we're, we're asking for. You know, the, um, uh, the, depart the, the government is going ahead on a very limited basis with these promise zones or promise neighborhood hood grants, um, which I wish they were doing a lot more of. But I think the, you know, we're hearing more and more about this argument about the importance of context, and it's not just in the school, it is in the community, it is in the families. Um, I, I, I just would love to hear you keep telling people how important these things are. You know, today we heard a lot about, well, we shouldn't just be measuring uh, students, we've got to be measuring what's going, what the teacher's doing, right? we, and maybe the classroom is more than just the aggregation of the students, how do we keep these things? Well, keep us, you know, keep us, let's keep the whole ecology, the whole environment here uh, in this perspective. That would be very useful. Other questions? I think a question that's come up from reading RFAs from IES over the years, and I'm, um, I've noticed the persistence on academic achievement outcomes. <laughs> In, um, in all of those RFAs. And then I hear you describing the importance of other indicators and other outcomes, and I'm just curious about how you reconcile those <laughs> two, uh, you know, the, how, do you, how you reconcile that contrast. Well, uh, let me first say, um, after I'd been at IES about a year, you know, there's this board called the National Board of Education Sciences, and one of the, it's an advisory board, one thing they do is they approve the director's uh, priorities. And the priorities clearly state that we expanded the priorities. Working down to the RFAs has been a little tougher. Uh, this last round is quite clear that academic achievement and uh, y y the outcome that you measured does not have to be academic achievement, but you have to build a case that it's related to academic achievement. You know, it's um, the, obviously, the um, IES was created at a time where school achievement was, te it was test scores and a, and a couple of other indicators. And we know more now. We're trying to broaden it out, and we're trying to, uh, to work down into the RFAs. But this last, this last batch, 
does clearly state in several instances it's, it's, it, it doesn't have to be exclusively achieve, achievement scores. But I'm with you, sir. <laughs> David? Um, I know you were with us, and it does seem that there is a movement in the administration to come a little closer with us as well. There still are countervailing forces in the Department of Education and probably beyond. What are things that we can do in our work that can help you move the process forward in IES right. and also might impact elsewhere? Right. So I have to be really careful around this sorts of thing. You know, IES is separate from the policy environment of the Department of Education, but we maintain relationships and so forth. So where I see some leverage points inside the department are, for example, in school turnaround. You're finally hearing to, uh, beginning to hear on the school improvement grants, you're hearing a lot about the importance of school climate. And that was kind of, you know, on the fringes. So I think get a look for places like that and help them become more vocal, help them, they're doing it. Uh, help it become more, um, uh, visible, give, the, give them some greater status to, to show that that work is important and it's probably you know where they're going to get the payoff anyway. Uh, so I think we've got we've to choose program by program where it's happening, where people understand what they're doing and get them greater visibility. Thanks very much. So we obviously we need more me we need measurement. We also need good measurement, and and measurement is changing in some ways. It's interesting the two examples you held up your your, your fit and, and the uh, the device for listening are uh, technologically based. They're continuous measurement. They're outside of the research setting, out in the real world. Uh, and I'm a survey researcher, so I live on the Likert scales and. I wonder if you could comment about what you see as good measurement and what, how you see measurement changing in the field. Um, well, I think we're always going to have to have a range of measures where we don't want to ever get stuck with a single way of doing anything. And I think we have to continue to develop. I mean, I, technology is obviously going to be uh, something. Um, I had some correspondence with a woman I mentioned, Dana Suskind, who uses Lena, and I told her I bought a Fitbit, and she said, well, we gotta get our Lena's more like a Fitbit, and so it syncs more quickly, they don't have to wait for weekly reports, uh, that sort of thing. But, but the, you know, you know, the liquid scales are gonna probably be the meat and potato for a long time to come, so we've gotta just keep developing and keep uh, iterating on all, all we're doing. Uh, and you know, different things are going to serve different purposes. Um, you know, a lot, we we often ask too much of single measures. We ask too much of our achievement test. Uh, the achievement test scores are a good example. We need a portfolio of um, uh, of approaches and possibilities. Bob, that's interesting. Just related to that, John, I, I had a talk with someone from the MacArthur Foundation just the other day about badging. Um, and, it, and it was an entirely, it, it seemed like an entirely different construct around measuring how one would go about measuring the development of competencies, because it's related to this idea of a portfolio. And this is a portfolio I carry with me, you know, as a professional or as a, as a, as a student. And, and even to the point of, um, of of arranging ways in which those badges are constructed around other people who have a certain level of endorsement or credibility reporting about my competence. You know, and I, so I'm accruing, uh, accruing this evidence, if you will, over a period of time. It seems to just sort of totally change the way we think about assessment and measurement and these kind of things. And um, it, are you seeing any of that? Um, I mean, th th this struck me as sort of out here somewhere, really interesting, lots of potential. You don't see much of that connected into what we're doing in terms of mainstream, you know, uh, education science and, and, and policy 
uh, work, but the applicability, I was thinking in terms of teacher preparation, but, but mm -hmm. I think the applicability of it is, is tremendous. Are you seeing any of that make its way into the institute at all um, in, in, in proposals or anything? Yeah, I, I'm sorry, Bob, I can't answer that. I would love to, I don't, I don't know. I mean, it sounds like where it should go. Uh, do you have any suggestions how we could improve our measurement goal to get to get better at that? I mean, that, I mean that's where uh, you know they're very concrete, discreet. Maybe they should. Maybe we should rewrite that. By the way, you know our, our RFA. So we 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 have a new commissioner for the National Center for Education Research, Tom Brock, who's just fabulous, and he's come in with all these ideas, and he. He got there just as we were, well, we were struggling with financial problems and all this stuff, but we had to get the new RFAs out. And Tom said, why is the RFA four times as long as the, the maximum limit on proposals? <laughs> <laughs> what does it say about us that we expect our, our applicants to write in 25 pages what we can't write in 100 pages? So, Tom has this wonderful uh, energy and attitude, and his, prior, uh, his second priority is rewriting those RFAs. And any input on the measurement goal, Bob, would, would just be fabulous. Thank you very much for joining us today and have a lovely afternoon.